The nationalists in the 50 cent army had started to go after my wife. We were tailed multiple times and they were walking around asking people if they had seen me or if they knew where I was. Do you think you would be in jail had you stayed another week, another month? Winston Sturzel and Matthew Tai, they both lived in China for a decade and they're now popular YouTubers covering all things China. China, like you've never seen it before. All the propaganda is geared towards creating enemies abroad that want to hurt or tarnish or weaken China. A suspected Chinese spy balloon hovering over the northern US. They block the majority of the internet, over 70% of the internet. If you can change and warp the majority of how AI sees things, or the majority of data that goes into AI to feed it to learn, then you've manipulated history completely. What do you see coming out of China? You see high-speed rails, flashy buildings, Belt and Road Initiative, leading the world in AI. All of this stuff isn't real. Entire cities designed to look like Paris, Venice, London, even Jackson Hole, Wyoming. It puts so much money into the propaganda and into this image so that the rest of the world feels intimidated. China's military says that it is ready to fight after completing three days of large-scale combat exercise around Taiwan. It's worth talking about, and it's worth the risk, and it's worth doing, because if you're not going to stand up against tyranny, then what the hell are you doing? All right. Well, welcome, guys. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you for thank having you us very, on. Very yeah. much. We're very happy to be here. Mm -hmm. So happy. So, uh, Matt, I want to start with you. At sure. the end, one of uh, I've watched a lot of both of your videos, but I think one of the crazier stories is your exit from China uh, yeah. and uh, kind of having to use Hong Kong as a jumping off point to get out. Yeah. You've got the video up. I can point everyone towards it, but I'm wondering sure. if you can give us sort of a uh, collapsed version of that because yeah. this establishes your bona fides as like, you're, you're legit. <laughs> they, sure. they were really yes. trying yeah. to get you. Quick breakdown because he's definitely going to want to check out the whole video for sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I wouldn't be able, let's just say I wouldn't be able to go to Hong Kong and uh, escape from China these days, not yeah. after the whole national security law, but to run you through it, basically um, after we shot our last uh, documentary, which we were traveling around China, showing all the positive things, getting out in the countryside, kind of like, you know, showing people the side of China that the propaganda doesn't show you, but it's also the positive side, the, the human side of things. Um, we were tailed multiple times by the Public Security Bureau, by Chinese police, by SWAT team, by the PLA, People's Liberation Army. Uh, they were just super paranoid about any foreigner, uh, a couple you know, guys not from China walking around with cameras. And that became very, very apparent um, towards the end because uh, when I got back, a friend of mine told me that at this bar in the city that I lived at, um, there was this bar that a lot of foreigners used to go to. I was not that guy. I wasn't the guy that went to the foreign expat bar. So I was very lucky to not be there that night oh, because the uh, cops were walking around with my photo and they were walking around asking people if they had seen me or if they knew where I was. And the, the wonderful thing about this um, at that very moment was the previous job that I had that I was registered to didn't have me registered to where I was currently living. So there was a little bit of time in between getting that warning from my friend um, for me to be, be able to pack a bag, basically run over to my buddy Winston here and say, could you potentially drive me to the border and get me the hell out of here until we figure out what the hell's going on? That's a real friend right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was actually there when, yeah, when, when you were getting the messages yeah. and, uh, I was just like, man, you got to get out of here, yeah, yeah. you know, just grab, grab your laptop, grab a change of clothes. Let's go. And yeah. We and just went. Not with the idea that I would never be back, just with the idea that, you know, if anything went down, at least I could be in Hong Kong where there'd be another layer of security where I could potentially get out of the country, get, get back to America if everything blew up. So what happened was uh, I laid down in the car. Yep. Wow. Now keep in mind in China, there are cameras everywhere, literally everywhere. Um, there's one, what is it? One camera for every seven citizens nowadays. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, across the whole country. So mm -hmm. we're barreling down the highway towards the, uh, the border. And finally, when I get there, I get out and I am just sweating bullets, waiting in line at immigration to exit mainland China and enter, uh, Hong Kong. But the thing is between China and Hong Kong, there's this no man's land. It's kind of like, uh, neither, neither place is jurisdiction, at least mm -hmm. not back then. And I'm waiting in line. And I, everything kind of works out. It's fine. But they call me back and there's an issue with my passport, right? 
And the thing that triggered this whole thing was I, that I was very concerned about was while I was leaving, the guy asked me if I had a Chinese name. And that's something I'd never been asked before. It's never something that has ever come up before. And so as I get past this and I'm like, whew, and I go, you know, to, to scan my bag and all this kind of stuff, I actually get confronted by a female Chinese police officer who asks me after talking to the uh, the border guard dude that went through passport control? So you're you're already passed. Yeah, I've already so you're passed. already I'm in exited no man's man. Land. You're in the man. Yeah, in in there. And mm-hmm. the the Chinese female police officer asks me. She says, "Are you coming back to mainland China after your visit in Hong Kong?" And I said, uh, "Yeah." And she goes, "Good." And just leaves me like that, right? Turns out, after I get into Hong Kong and I figure all this kind of stuff out, there had been a collaborative effort of by the Chinese government to track me. Uh, where I live, to find me and, and kind of construct a case with the People's Liberation Army, the Public Security Bureau, and just the Chinese government in general, uh, wow. together with the traffic department in, in the city I was living, to find me and make me an example, right? And it was what terrifying. Does, what does that mean, by the way? So do you think you would be in jail had you stayed another week, another month? Yeah. Yeah, wow. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Because, and I say this, because just soon after that, a friend mm-hmm. of ours named Michael Spaver yep. uh, from Canada ended up going to political prison. And this is a person that we had worked together with uh, while, we were, our documentary. while we were putting yeah. together that documentary where we were tailed. And he yeah. ended up going to political prison for, what was it, two years or something Yeah, before he was uh, sent back to Canada in the whole Huawei, Meng Wanzhou thing. I won't get into that. If your audience doesn't know about it, you can just Google it. Um, but basically, we avoid. I avoided the inevitable, so to yeah, speak. Yeah, the, the border guard obviously made a mistake yeah. by letting you through. He had some suspicions, yeah. and then he wasn't sure it was you and let you through. And then that's why the other person approached you. And, and they, they knew that I would be back. Yeah. Right? So, okay, just wait till he gets back. That's yeah. That's the idea, at least. Wow. And if... Since then, obviously, things have changed in Hong Kong. Safe to say that if it were 2023, same story, they let you through to Hong Kong, you're still in trouble. Oh, yeah. Like if Winston and I even transit to Hong Kong, let's say uh, we're going to South Korea and they're like, oh, it's a quick detour. We got to stop in Hong Kong real quick. You better believe we're the first two people off that plane going to jail. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so not going back to China for you guys anytime soon. No, <laughs> no unfortunately <laughs> not anymore. And it's not just speculation either. We've no. we've got people within yeah. China that are connected to the government who've warned us and yes. told us not to do it. Well, this is and this is the thing that you guys make abundantly clear, which I'll highlight for you, which is the difference between the Chinese people and the Chinese government. Even right, in yeah. this story, there was somebody who you I don't think know who reached out to you that tipped yes. you off to all this happening. Can you talk a yes. do you have any idea where that came from? I suspect the person that set up that interaction um, was sympathetic to my cause. And I do think that there is a certain amount of people, at least locally where I live, that were friendly enough towards me to want the best for me, to make sure that I wasn't made an example out of. Um, And I'll be honest with you, it's not like everyone in the Chinese Communist Party is like some gung-ho, red-blooded communist, you know, going out there trying for world domination. There's people that work in the Communist Party of China that have connections that do it because it's their job, right? Mm -hmm. We have many friends in the Chinese Communist Party, yeah. at least when we were living there. Yeah, so um, many people do because the, the benefits of being a part of the Chinese Communist Party are great. You know, there's a lot of social benefits you get that the average citizen doesn't. So it's worth your while to join the party. Yeah, so it's not like, I mean, what is there, 90 million members? It's not out of the realm of possibility that like somebody was a fan of mine and mm-hmm. they sympathize with me. You know? mm. That's that's awesome. Winston, your exit was not quite as dramatic, right? No, it wasn't as dramatic, <laughs> but it was also, uh, it just had to happen. It was dramatic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, at, at the end of the day, things started to get really hairy for me. And um, as as Matt mentioned, when Michael Spaver got nabbed, mm. that was really the last uh, straw. Because, you know, he's uh, an acquaintance of the two of us. I'd been sending him messages back and forth on WeChat, which the government has access to. Um, and, you know, ha- having seen them swoop in and, take him like that i knew that we were next i mean the pressure was mounting they uh the the nationalists and the 50 cent army had started to go after my wife and had actually it had had led to some scary situations where people were turning up at her employer you know at the hospital that she worked at to try and find her with printouts from the internet of her and myself together 
showing these around in the HR department to see if she worked at that hospital, trying yeah. to find her, you know. And um, they constructed this elaborate 24-page uh, document, which they sent to the Public Security Bureau and to her hospitals and to the medical board because she's a doctor in China. And all these places trying to paint my wife as a spy and a collaborator and a sympathizer with the foreign powers to try and get her in jail in order to silence me, to intimidate me, to stop making videos. It was getting very hairy and I had to leave and I, I left just in time. Wow. One of the things that I, I just notice when you guys tell your stories is on the one hand, the Chinese government seems so wildly effective at controlling what people do, like incredibly effective. But then I hear you guys talk about the propaganda and how silly some of it is, you know, painting mountains green or faking birds or having these uh, astroturf campaigns of people saying that they're on the Korean border when or they're on the Korean border or the Japanese border, but getting the two confused or something like that. Yeah. To the American eye, their propaganda seems foolish. I'm curious, how, what is the grip on the Chinese population's understanding of what is going on? Or are they just disconnected from all of it? Yeah, I want to highlight something prior to, to getting into what happens domestically really quick, because that has changed very recently. Mm -hmm. What we've seen is that Chinese propaganda was laughable and silly, and we can still find a lot of holes in it and poke fun and make fun of all these foibles and follies and stuff. But very recently, after the whole Putin and Xi thing came together, where they both decided that, hey, we're going to be best buds from now on. We have seen a massive, massive upgrade in the effectiveness and quality of Chinese propaganda on American mm -hmm. audiences and just, you know, audiences abroad as well. Yeah. In fact, there's been a lot of good studies very recently about the efficacy of Chinese propaganda and how it has improved. Okay. So that is something we're going to be start. We're going to start getting into a, in a lot more detail. But the propaganda that's aimed for your eyes or the English speaking world or even people in different countries that speak different languages is very different than the domestic propaganda in China. The domestic propaganda in China serves to consolidate power and make sure that the party, the Chinese Communist Party, is at the forefront of people's minds as their identity as a Chinese person. So mm -hmm. anything that is claimed to be Chinese culture or Chinese history or China, anything to do with China, the creator and the protector of that thing, of that entity, is the Chinese government. So if you try to remove the Chinese government from that thing, from being Chinese, then effectively China has lost. China has bowed down to the foreign powers. China has become uh, a weak in some way. So all the propaganda is geared towards creating enemies abroad that want to hurt or tarnish or weaken China. And your identity comes from the fact that you have this beautiful, strong power, which is led by Xi Jinping. His ideology will keep you safe from all of those foreign threats. Mm. Yeah, and it, so just, it sounds like that's that's tapping into an existing nationalist sentiment and linking it into a government structure. Right. Correct. And it's incredibly effective. You know, actually, propaganda in China in general is just incredibly uh, effect effective. And the reason for this is there's no alternative. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, uh, having worked in the education sphere, all the way from teaching kindergarten when I first got to China, all the way up to teaching, you know, sort of high school uh, university and then into the, the workforce and teaching, you know, uh, oh. where they still do communist um, education and stuff in the companies and have all these things. Everybody is taught from a very young age uh, um, to love the party and to worship the party and that the communist party is the, the be all and the end all and everyone else is an enemy. And uh, it's, it's kind of a horrendous thing to witness firsthand to see how effective it is. But on top of that, all of the newspapers, all of the TV shows, all of the internet is censored heavily and is only allowed to put forward the party's message. And so it's so difficult for somebody who comes from the free world or from any country, really, to understand exactly how effective it is. If you're only getting your information from a single source, then you're going to believe a certain thing. It's like being in a cult where you're cut off from the outside world and the only information you have is from the cult leader who's telling you, you know, the, the rest of the world is bad and you must believe this and this is how the world works and this is how everything works. This is how uh, health works. This is, you know, they can tell you whatever. And that since that's your only source of information, you believe it because you have no alternatives. Uh, and so, yes, the, the domestic propaganda is incredibly effective. 
And so what what are the core tenets of the domestic propaganda? You mentioned one is linking the uh, strength of the government to Chinese nationalism uh, as regards, you know, things like COVID or the American people versus the American government. What have the Chinese people been sort of instructed and programmed to think about the world? Yeah, so there was a golden period, we like to call it, uh, the golden period when we lived in China prior to Xi Jinping's rule, even into Xi Jinping's rule before he really started to strengthen his core leadership within the party. We like to call that when China was kind of experimenting with being on the world stage. It was kind of cool to interface with foreigners as a Chinese person. It was encouraged. It was almost like, yes, we are Chinese, we are proud, and there is existing nationalism, patriotism there. Sure. But that kind of switch isn't turned on all the time because China and Chinese people were encouraged to be interfacing with foreign people from different countries, starting partnerships and and corporations together and um, kind of projecting China's image abroad, but at the same time, allowing certain elements of foreign culture within China to proliferate, Mm. uh, whether it be a foreign bar or a a cultural exchange, you know, uh, English corner or something like this. All this stuff was promoted at that time. And then Something happened um, around, we like to say around 2015 to 2017 was a really hotbed time Mm. for when the nationalism really got ramped up. And what people were taught then was that, no, the outside world is not actually your friend. Mm. Everything that has has led to the success of modern China, the economy, because we have to admit that the economy boomed. It went crazy. I mean, people started getting wealthy and Mm -hmm. China really lifted out of uh, abject poverty, so to speak, at that time. And that was not because of the collaborative efforts of foreign companies and people wanting to invest in China. That was just because of the party. And this idea that the rest of the world is to be cooperated with stopped. That propaganda proliferated in in foreign countries. That's what China wanted other countries to think. But domestically, Chinese people were taught that, no, actually, everyone's trying to trick us, belittle us, and weaken us, kind of like what happened in the opium wars and things like this, hearkening back to these really kind of uh, tangible scars that people have learned throughout their education system and turning on that nationalistic tap to where now Chinese people believe, hey, well, actually, maybe the world doesn't want the best for us and they're trying to weaken us. And every time something bad happens here, like an economic downturn or a housing collapse or the healthcare system gets over, you know, completely overrun, that is not the fault of China or Chinese people or the Chinese government anymore. That is because Western powers or other countries want those bad things to happen to us. So it morphed from let's participate with the world to propaganda now targeting the Chinese citizens to say, no, this new world is going to be us separated from the rest of the world. And I'd like to to just really hone in on the fact that people can talk about communism all day. What we're actually talking about is the Communist Party of China not being the party so much anymore, but just being Xi Jinping. And it's really much more akin, instead of the Soviet Union nowadays, it's much more akin to North Korea in the Kim dynasty, where Xi Jinping's ideology is from, you know, kindergarten all the way through adulthood. And that's actually what leads everything in China. Yeah, definitely. You know, the biggest mechanism of Chinese propaganda, the biggest thing that they use, this trick they use every single time, is whenever there's a failing in China, a failing of the Communist Party, they suddenly blame the outside world and they ramp up nationalism. And it's the easiest way for people to forget about blaming the government and to not turn on the government. And this is what they do time and time again. This is really the main purpose for all of their propaganda. Of course, you see all the propaganda about how strong China is and how China is now not reliant on the rest of the world. And they've overtaken that. Yes, they were developing, but now we've reached the peak. Now, you know, now we're really where we're supposed to be. And the rest of the world looks up to us now. And we're the leaders. You see that kind of propaganda. But the main thing you see in the propaganda all the time is how bad the rest of the world is. And many times during our stay in China, we saw this with our own eyes. And I'll give a very clear example is when there was this huge scandal surrounding Bo Xilai, which was um, a big political upheaval within the Chinese Communist Party. And um, so this was causing a huge scandal. There was a lot of things surrounding this. You know, some foreigner got poisoned and some – there was a huge big thing going on. And suddenly – this island, the Senkaku Islands, which is what they're called in Japan, or the Diaoyu Dao in, in China, these random islands, which have belonged to Japan since forever, 
But uh, China claims, you know, because of ancient maps or something, it belongs to China. No one cared about that one. No one even knew about Very that. Very little significance. It's like no one knows. All of a sudden, this huge thing started where the Chinese government was saying, this is ours. The Senkaku Islands, I mean, the Diaoyu Dao belong to China. This is China's island. Japan is trying to steal our sovereign territory type thing. And the entire populace went wild about this stupid island. And it was so prolific that people started to destroy Japanese vehicles like Toyotas. They watched the Honda get flipped and yeah, burned. Yeah, exactly. They smashed sushi restaurants. They went just crazy. The sign postage outside of shops and mm-hmm. random restaurants would be like, the, the Diaoyu Dao belong to China. And you go to the Google equivalent, Baidu, and their main splash page is like, the China, you know, the, the island belongs to China, all that kind of nonsense. It was on the news. It was on the radios. And all of a sudden, this big political scandal disappeared because everyone is focusing and raging on Japan because there's an island and Japan hadn't even done anything. They didn't go and like put a flag on it or anything. There was nothing. It just came out of nowhere. And this is how the Chinese propaganda is so effective. The Chinese communist propaganda from diverting away from the very real problems that China faces. Yeah, I have a, just a quick example. It's a personal example. What happened was there was a big, and there has been a big influx of, uh, let's just say outflux of Chinese people trying to leave China and to either get asylum in the U.S. And there was a huge uptick in that a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, and just people leaving in general, trying to get their money out. The Chinese government government's making it very difficult for people to, to get out of China. And the Chinese government thinks it's a really bad look when their citizens are trying to leave in the millions, right? <laughs> so yeah, when I left China, the Chinese government, well, the state media took a video of me and my wife, right, yeah. my Chinese wife, and completely or kind of removed the voice from it and did a like a almost like a voiceover over the top of it with subtitles in Chinese about and I think I believe my wife and I were talking about like spicy food or something completely unrelated mm-hmm. and has this video about how my wife divorced me is divorcing me and she is like super super upset because she thought America was going to be great but when she got to America, she saw that there was people rioting in the streets and like thieves and people robbing her all the time. And she just cries every night because she just wants to go back to China where it's safe. And I, I ended oh up putting gosh. out a video about the whole thing. But yeah. yeah, that's what they do is they try to deflect away from domestic issues by using the foreign threat as a problem. Wow. That isn't one incredibly savvy the way that uh, yeah. they're able to do that. I'm rem- I'm reminded as I think of America, which is, you know, in some ways uh, very opposite of this. One, at the highest level, it seems like we're grappling with xenophobia, racism, and all those kinds of things, but trying to do away with it versus this seems to be a a lever of unification that China is able to use, you know, to get behind the CCP and anti-Japan or anti-America. Is that a fair understanding of China that they are perhaps even ratcheting up their xenophobia or racism? I couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah. That was a great analogy. 100%. 100%. Wow. Okay. And I mean, I see, you know, the divisiveness that can happen when you're like, no, the fracture is within our own country. And that's, there's wounds that we need to heal inside of our country versus there is no fracture in our country. The fracture is with us and the uh, the rest of the world. Where you draw that line at who you need to work with slash fight against seems incredibly savvy <laughs> for somebody yeah. to, to yeah. do. And okay. So I, I appreciate you correcting me on the effectiveness of the propaganda um, let's go back then. You mentioned that it is getting more effective in the West. So I see how that is uh, incredibly unifying inside of China. When I watch some of your videos on the Quora answers that they have that are in you know, somewhat broken English and are like just these obvious, when you look at them, like, is it true that Xi Jinping is the greatest? And it's like, well, actually, he is. You know, like, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's Quora in a nutshell. Right there. That's just Quora. Yeah. No way not Quora to answer me about that. Yeah. So, so when I look at that, I go, this is impossible to fall, fall for. This must be for a domestic audience. What is happening outside that you have seen be effective on a Western audience? So actually, that's a good segue. Um, the, I think the Quora thing is a great thing to bring up because as laughable as it is to go to Quora and see an article say, um, like you said, is Xi Jinping, the, is it true that Xi Jinping <laughs> is the greatest? It, why was China's COVID prevention so successful while the U.S. <laughs> burned to the ground, right? Yeah. It's just these rhetorical questions that already answer themselves. And to see the user base have 
I don't know, 10,000 articles under their belt that release them, you know, within minutes of each other to see those articles get upvoted by, you know, what we, we suspect to be bot armies. You look at that and you think that's ridiculous, but what that serves, at least in our theory, after researching this, is that what this serves to do is that when you can populate Google search results and be the dominant force amongst those search results, you can actually tap into the majority of people's psyche. Because if someone's Googling something, let's say a good example was they want to learn about the uh, genocide of Native Americans in the U.S. They want to learn about the history that we learn about in school, uh, the very wide, you know, widely talked about topic in, in America's kind of dark history, right? China has managed to populate a lot of those search results with its own government sources, Quora articles, things well, like this. Well, even better, right? when you search Uyghur genocide, the first result in Google was the American Native American genocide. Yes. And the article that it was linking, the top result, was a Chinese government article. Right. Mm. So what this serves to do is, let's say you don't even read into those, but if you can mm -hmm. read or you kind of graze past these headlines, and the vast majority of them have a pro-Chinese government slant, then you've already kind of entered the psyche of people that aren't going to go through every single source and read through every ridiculously worded answer. What you've done is changed SEO or search engine optimization to be in your favor. And this serves two purposes. One, for the people that aren't going to look deeply into these things and realize that they're reading Chinese propaganda or at least glancing at it. And number two, for the future of AI, the way the AI works, just a very, very simple way of doing things, is to gather data, to gather language, to gather uh... points across the internet. So from there, you can shape how future search results are going to be. Let's be honest. We know that Google, the way that traditional Google works, is not going to be how search engines work in the future because of big data, because of machine learning, right? Mm -hmm. But if you can change and warp the majority of how AI sees things or the majority of data that goes into AI to feed it to learn, then you've manipulated history completely, right? And we saw that a very good example of this is how China – always referred to itself or didn't really care if people called the Chinese government the CCP. Yeah, it used to call itself that in official articles up until about 2017-ish. Then all of a yeah. sudden in 2017 mm -hmm. and onwards, we see this massive push from the Chinese government to say, you can't call the Chinese government the, C the C CCP anymore. That's racist. Mm -hmm. That comes from like Western forces that want to see the downfall of China. Mm -hmm. We are called the CPC. Right. So now they've tried to have this big rebrand called the CPC or the, the Communist Party of China. Now, officially, technically, in English, it would be called that, but they never really cared. It was just kind of colloquially they, known. Even, they even admit in, in government literature online in Chinese that either or is OK. Yes. They admit that. But now they've pushed this narrative. And the reason they've done that, obviously, is to whitewash the past. Yes. It's like a criminal changing his identity, because now if you search CCP, You'll come up with a list of like Tiananmen Square Massacre. 50 years of articles. All 50 years of bad and good things that China has been involved in. But if you type in CPC, it'll only bring in the last couple of years of very curated Chinese government government articles. Right. Because no one managed, calls it CPC. No, which they've managed to mm. dominate search engine optimization with. Yeah. And we've seen that, as to answer your question, as a very successful way to manipulate people in a very successful way that Chinese propaganda has worked is the sheer brute force of it. Yeah. The sheer use of, of technology and it works so much it's, to their benefit because it spans, yeah. they block the majority of the internet, over 70% of the internet. Everything is blocked. YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, all these things for their own populace. But what they do is on an official level is use thousands and thousands, if not millions of accounts sponsored by the Chinese government on Western platforms to manipulate the algorithm mm -hmm. and make sure that people are fed positive messages about the Chinese government. And that's something yeah. we have such a hard time combating because this, yeah, we can't. we're independent voices. We don't have bot accounts. We're just two guys on YouTube, right? Yeah. The spamming is a big thing. I mean, think about this. Imagine you've got a, <clears throat> an article and somebody writes a, a comment on there, which is truthful. Says so like, I was there. It's true. What's in the mm. article? If you have a thousand people downvoting that comment and just spamming something about, oh, China is great or something, nobody will ever read that real comment, you see? So it's more just a brute force way of pushing an opinion out there and getting rid of dissenting opinions. I have one current example, if you have time for this. Just Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's something I'm working on right now. It was something that I, it was affecting me. And I, as a guy that watches Chinese propaganda to make videos to make sure that people are getting the truth, 
it actually was affecting me. I kept seeing this word. It was de-dollarization. I'm yes. Actually making a okay. About it I'm right so now. glad you touched on this because this has right. been my big worry about China. Oh my God, we're going to lose. Please <laughs> right. continue. Yeah. So as somebody that's not super savvy on economics, I kind of pushed this topic down the road. People kept asking me, hey, can you talk about this de-dollarization thing? I'm like, ah, yeah. You know, I'm not an expert. I have to get some experts to, to teach me about it first, right? Finally, the day came. Or I'm like, you know what? I'm I keep seeing this de-dollarization thing everywhere, like on my YouTube feed, on my Twitter feed, on mm-hmm. in, in Instagram, even. Uh, people keep sending me TikTok videos about it. I'm like, what is going on with this de-dollarization thing? So I start looking into it and I started asking economists about it. And what it is is BRICS, which is China's kind of new multipolar world idea. It's like they're gonna have uh, you know, Brazil, Russia, China, India, they're going to have the South, South Africa. Africa, they're going to have yeah. these countries kind of tied together to fight off the U.S. hegemony and to make sure the U.S. doesn't control the world. They'll have their own kind of economic situation. And what's going on is they've created this idea of de-dollarization that maybe in the, fu- in the very near future or right now, it's unfolding right now, that people are going to start trading or countries are going to start trading in yuan, in Chinese RMB, so the Chinese currency, as opposed to the, the dollar standard that most countries have used for foreign exchange. And I'm talking to people about this, and these economists are like, what are you what are you talking about? That's not happening at all, sending me graphs and things. The last report in 2022 was that 88% of the world's foreign exchanges are still being done in the US dollar, which is even higher than some of the, you know, the past 30 within the past 30 years of some of these uh, uh, foreign exchange f- figures within the, uh, using the U.S. currency as the, as the uh, dominant currency for foreign exchange. So we're looking at a situation where China, after I looked at it, is pumping out hundreds, if not thousands of articles, is getting influencers to talk about de-dollarization, to throw this word around. We even saw it on Russian state media mm-hmm. over and over again to the point where if you don't look into it, like myself, you just start thinking it's the norm. Oh, De-dollarization, I'm not really into economics, so I guess people are using the dollar less. That's what I'm thinking. Oh, I guess the Chinese uh, yuan is becoming more powerful. I'm not going to look into it, right? I Google it. Maybe I look at some cursory results, and it's all Chinese-sponsored content. Yeah. And you realize very quickly it is a Chinese government spy op that Russia is tagging along on. And then when you start to break it down, you realize that you've been affected by this almost apathy of not really wanting to look into it but almost a fear of missing out too. Because if somebody else brings it up in conversation and says, oh, you hear about this de-dollarization thing? Oh, yeah, 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 I heard about that. It's crazy, you know? And eventually it becomes solidified in your mind to where you didn't look into it. You've passively consumed hours and hours of Chinese propaganda about the topic to where you now think maybe that's the case. Wow. I mean, you're talking to me uh, and this one. So I've watched... You know, there are YouTube videos from people who are absolutely not Chinese plants or anything like that. Sure. Big finance oh. YouTubers. Uh, I'll tell you my experience with the de-dollarization thing because I did act on it. I didn't buy any Chinese UN, but I uh, started seeing about this de-dollarization stuff. Friends sends me graphs that foreign uh, banks are increasing their gold reserves and decreasing sure. their dollar reserves, things like that. You know, data which might be factually true, but of course, finding the narrative in this, while there are failing banks in the United States, uh, Silicon Valley Bank goes down, one or two other regional banks go down. Balaji, I don't know if you're familiar with him, he's talking about how Bitcoin is going to be ascendant, it's going to be a million dollars. And it seems like while there might be truth to uh, people trying to figure out what's going on with the dollar, there's fluctuations in foreign trade, a story like that can be tapped into and ridden by the CCP to be like, okay, there is this thing, which is there's some fluctuation going on. We can ride that to destabilize the dollar and insert that, you know, the, the RMB is, is in ascendancy more than it maybe really is, which can actually then make it true, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is what's difficult. That's a great example of, and by the way, absolutely, this is not necessarily something that isn't happening. Mm-hmm. This is something that's being preyed upon by Chinese state media for its own narrative, right? So that's what I was following. It's, if it seems fishy, you look into it. And what I noticed is that since China's partnership with Russia in particular, mm-hmm. Instead of saying China good, CCP good, you must believe in us. Now it's more like there's this specific example we can use, a bank collapse, uh, Mm -hmm. gold reserves being tapped into, right? We can use a specific example and then exacerbate on that and absolutely spam the crap out of everyone 
about how the U.S. is completely doomed and already has fallen apart and the, U and the UN and the, the Chinese government is going to take over and be the dominant force in the world. That's what's happened. It's taking and preying on people. It's almost like a boy who cried wolf scenario here. Mm -hmm. And then nobody looks into it to actually see what's, what the motivation might be. Well, especially Americans are so wrapped up in domestic politi uh, politics mm. and what happens within America. So, you know, hey, a bank collapses like that. It's a worrying thing. People are focused on it. They know all about it. Then you get an outside actor coming in and saying, yes, you see what's happening here? That's because your dollar sucks and our yen is going, now we're going to trade with Brazil only using yen. Now we're going to mm. do this. You better worry. See, you're in flames. Your entire system's screwed. Meanwhile, the Chinese system is a complete chaos. It's just chaos. It's a joke what's going on with BRICS and everything else. The dollar is still incredibly strong. There's nothing going wrong. There are hiccups and problems going on in America, just like there always are, and there are in every single country. But China's very good at hopping on the fact that Americans specifically don't look outside of their borders. And all of these local domestic problems get blown out of proportion. So they feed on that and they help breed the paranoia and they spread division and they make sure that it works in their favor. And that's what they're very good at doing these days. So you're sort of saying that a lack of my understanding of, you know, I know about the banks that failed the United States, but I don't know about whatever is happening in China that is falling apart or not working. And therefore yeah. the comparison that I might be making in my mind is easily corrupted by, you know, China's on the ascendancy and I can see all the problems in America, which Yes. then lets credibility to that. Interesting. Oh, think about it. I mean, what do you see coming out of China? You see high-speed rails, yes. flashy buildings, Belt and Road Initiative, dealings with Africa. You know, you see all of these, these big projects that they want you to see, mega projects, building bridges, you know, oh, leading the world in AI, whatever. All of this stuff isn't real. All of this stuff is fake and it's propaganda. Everything. The high-speed rail is running at a massive loss in China. There are accidents and problems that you don't hear about. All of this stuff that you think is flashy and far ahead, the AI stuff is a joke in China. They put mm. so much money into the propaganda and into this image so that the rest of the world feels intimidated. The rest of the world feels like, holy crap, look, China's got it switched on. They're so amazing. They're great. Look at our terrible... How terrible we are, especially in the States. Look at Philadelphia with all the drug addict zombies on the street because they keep showing that clip over and over again. Look, our banks are failing. Look at this. It's nonsense. Small little incidents all over the place blown out of proportion. And China's put this fancy facade up for everybody to see and think that they've got it switched on. They don't know what they're doing. They're making blunders all over the world. Their Belt and Road Initiative is a joke and falling apart. It's just debt and rubbish and nothing's being repaid and everything's falling apart. And uh, everything else that's supposed to be high tech and on the rise and great isn't when you look into it. Yeah, I want to give a concrete example so nobody thinks that's too grand of a statement. But yeah, like, yeah I, I love this. I just before you do, I mean, you said three things that I do want to come back to. One, I was under the impression they were crushing us in AI. Two, I was under the impression that the Belt and Road Initiative was absolutely dominant. And three, I remember articles about hypersonic missiles and that sort of thing, and the uh, the soon to be overwhelming technological power of the Chinese military. So would love examples because I haven't, I haven't even do, dove into those things at all enough to hear a counter example. So would okay. love to, to hear. I think, well, the example I was going to bring up, I think is the most important example in terms of what and nations are getting on board with for agreements about climate change. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's just a huge topic that everyone talks about. China keeps being lauded as the leader for the pioneer or proliferator, a best proliferator of, of green technology, uh, of solar and renewable energy and how they have solved all of these issues. They, yeah, they had pollution when they were developing and stuff, but now China's at the forefront and leading the world in green technology. And this is a super dangerous narrative because we're sitting here with a country that is getting on leadership boards of these multi multinational organizations and, and projects to kind of push the narrative of, of China paving the way and getting sort of kickbacks from all these ideas that China is leading the world in green technology, when in fact China, what they've done is increase their coal usage six times. So while the rest of the world tries to reduce emissions and really, really push, tries to push legislation that, you know, you know, causes a lot of debate in some societies and a lot of, but a lot of people can get behind because, hey, it's a sacrifice for the greater good of the earth. 
to reduce global warming. Yeah, Dutch uh, farmers, for instance. Yeah, yeah, for example. It's a contentious mm. issue in a lot of areas. While this becomes a debate and people are nitpicking and trying to figure this out, China is increasing coal usage six times. They're burning their, they are their CO2 building emissions. more coal-burning power plants. They're increasing their CO2 output exponentially. They're creating so much more pollution. But the rest of the world sees them as some kind of green tech leader. And it's like you well, say. It's because it's a, the narrative has been pushed. It's right? so dangerous. Yeah. And that's a bad precedent to set. When mm. you have the country making the potentially making the decisions of the future about what the, the, the state of the world and CO2 emissions and what is actually happening that is increasing their CO2 output and actually adding to the carbon footprint of the world exponentially to the point where China makes more CO2 emissions than every uh, developed nation combined. Mm -hmm. And that is a problem because that is not being fixed. They're being congratulated for something that they're doing wrong. And mm. that's a bad precedent to set, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, to to touch on, on the military aspect that you were talking about, the, the high-tech military, one thing you have to understand about the Chinese military and their technology is that all of it is stolen. They have not invented anything new. So the Chinese government are not suddenly just creating a new terrible technology that's uh, ahead of the rest of the world. What they do do is they create a lot of something and cheaply. So, you know, if you've got a lot of a certain type of dangerous technology, they will produce a lot of it. That's something you have to worry about. Um, but it is all copies of something else. None of it is new. Uh, the hypersonic missile thing is real. They've been testing hypersonic missile delivery platforms for a very long time. In fact, the company that is tied to the spy balloon that went over the USA has been testing launch delivery vehicles for hypersonic missiles with those same balloons. And there's footage of that, you know, back in the day. They are testing things and they also don't have any qualms when it comes to morals, you know, the and um, the, the moral or the human cost when it comes to certain technologies, um, you know, Life is cheap, so certain things that other countries wouldn't develop, like bioweapons, for instance, they will. So there is a lot to worry about when it comes to, you know, the Chinese military and what they're capable of doing. But I wouldn't worry about them having advanced technology, just a lot of current technology. Got it. So wrapping up this uh, conversation about propaganda, which is, you know, always when you're talking about propaganda is very eye opening. Uh, yeah. Do you have, this is something I've struggled with for a long time. When I was 19, I moved abroad to Costa Rica and I had some of the U.S. propaganda sort of pulled out of my eyes and I've received some of the Costa Rican propaganda and you see, you know, anywhere you go, there's a degree of mythology that is told about what, how the world works. Uh, and it's getting more and more difficult to discern what is true, right? There's more and more people trying to muddy the water. Do you have any recommendations for people that are not as connected to the news as you are, who can maybe not read Mandarin, what should someone like me do? Should I just go, there's too many hands in this pot trying to affect what I believe. I'm better off not even hearing the word de-dollarization. Like how do I interact with the world at large knowing that there are so many people taking such drastic efforts to control my perception? I have a, an idea, which maybe everybody could try and practice a little bit, is um, specifically to, to the American audience out there. Is Americans are incredibly critical of their own government, mm. okay? It doesn't matter which political affiliation, um, you know, they're always going to be criticizing the people in the other party. They're always going to be criticizing the government. Every American I've met has had a lot of criticisms about some aspect of uh, society, in America, some aspect tied to the government, something to do with whether it's welfare or whether it's, um, you know, a, I don't know. Just There's always something. There's always something. Opportunities that are available to certain people. There's always something and there's a lot of focus on this. I would like you to try to take a fraction of that energy put into criticizing your own government and society and put it into another society for a minute, like China, for instance. If you're buying Chinese propaganda or Russian propaganda or whatever it is, if you're starting to believe that China's got a better system or China's the answer or something, take a little bit of that criticism and that critical thinking that you put to your own government, put it to the Chinese government um, and see what comes up. Because you cannot accept that an, a foreign government, for instance, or a foreign society is just flawless and that only your government is bad. Put a little bit of criticism, see what happens. I think um, at, a, at a policy level, 
this is why things are so important. Uh, it's so important for people to be able to see what uh, state labels there are on certain content. And we've been battling with YouTube with this for ages. There are so mm. many Chinese mm. government accounts out there that are not labeled as such. And they look like an independent voice like ourselves. That is not okay. I think that's deceptive. I think that's an unfair advantage for a country that cuts off its entire populace from this media to use propaganda accounts on that media to shape the opinions of people abroad is, is immoral. And I, I think these companies need to do something about it. We're seeing Twitter go backwards on these principles. Um, this state label thing is really important because yeah. if people don't know what they're consuming, then it can shape their mind to be kind of, I don't know, look at somewhere else as the alternative to something when it's in fact the inferior replacement for something. And mm -hmm. The actual practical thing, because nobody's going to be able to go out there and change policies of media companies or social media overnight. But what I can encourage people to do is just to make sure that when you are consuming something, take a little bit of that energy to look into why that might be, right? You use American propaganda as an example. Um, anything, really anything. If you look into a certain issue, go and Google, like for the de-dollarization thing is a great example. I'm not saying that de-dollarization isn't happening, but what I am saying is that there was a massive motivation from the Chinese government to cover that topic. And the vast majority of opinions out there seem to be stemming from a Chinese government initiative to talk about this. So find out why that was. Why would a government want to talk about this issue so much? And you can attribute that to any government or any, any principle, right? Yeah. Try to find the motivation. I, I have a great example. Uh, in looking this stuff up, I found a very independent looking media. I'm not going to name, name who this is, but it was an independent media. We fight against mainstream media. We go out there to try to get the truth out. We're not funded by anyone. We're a 501c nonprofit. Uh, we're out there to tell you the truth. And what I did was I spent an hour looking through their entire channel, their entire channel, which is a global news thing, trying to find one negative thing that they've said, one critical thing that they've said something about either Russia or China, and I could find nothing. But I could find hours upon hours of pro-CCP and pro-Russia propaganda on an English-speaking news channel talking about global issues, claiming that they're independent. You need to do things like that. You need to employ your own methodology of finding out what do you think the angle is behind this? Because it's not just... And I like to, people like to go out there and, and hate on mainstream media outlets like New York Times or Fox News or whatever. You can pick anything. This is bias. This is, you know, has a clear agenda and all this kind of stuff. Look into not only the agenda of the entire organization, but look at maybe look at uh, uh, what each journalist has talked about. Maybe look at what their angle is on things. When you're looking at YouTube, make sure you're looking at what kind of content they covered from what perspective. Take everything with a grain of salt. And don't fall into this algorithmic trap of consuming something that keeps feeding something to you over and over again. And again, to, not to come back over and over again, to circle back to Chinese propaganda, but if you consume Chinese propaganda, the algorithm feeds you more Chinese propaganda, and there's a lot of it to go around. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's really about educating yourself as well, not just taking people's word for it, mm -hmm. um, and not just consuming something and just taking it at face value, you know, look sure. into things. I mean, you guys, it occurred to me as you guys were talking and even in my question, um, it, your traveling was is clearly giving you guys a broader understanding. The fact that you learned the language, met people on the ground, you know, there's only so much you can read about that can defy what your own eyes and ears tell you. And even just having the experience one time of going to a completely different place, seeing that things are different than you heard, I think leaves a lasting skepticism that is really healthy uh and i yeah. know it's been it's been yeah. good for me yeah dude you know even i'm not american right so i know a lot about america because the american um news is talked about worldwide you know somebody gets shot in america or something and uh, you'll hear about it all over the world every quarter of the world you'll hear about something about police brutality or something because it's so hyper broadcast and focused on and uh you know american soft power when it comes to hollywood movies and stuff it permeates the entire globe. So I grew up, you know, with this idea of what America is. Coming to America, it's different, okay? <laughs> I'm not getting shot at. I'm not seeing drug addicts all over the place. I'm not seeing police brutality everywhere. I'm not seeing, uh, you know, the military bombing things all over the place. It's not what the media puts out there. It's one of those things you have to see with your own eyes. You know, once you see something, you can really judge it. Um, 
And of course, you can take everything else into consideration and see what's real and weigh things up and the severity of things. But just taking people's word for it and just listening to what the news has to say or what you know, biased media is out there are trying to say it's not the right way to do things. If you can experience something for yourself, you should. Yeah, I love that. And I mean, you guys, obviously, you motorcycled all over China. You guys got to see it firsthand, which is incredible. Um, let's. We've kind of been talking around and about it, but I, I'd like to just hear your guys' thoughts geopolitically. You've mentioned that China's kind of a shit show, I think. Yeah. Uh, in the next 10 years, broadly, there's two camps that I'm familiar with. There's the Ray Dalio camp. De-dollarization is happening. Uh, you know, the American empire is on the decline. China's on the ascendancy. It's a matter of time, and it's pretty much already written. Uh, and then there's the other one, which is I see in Peter Zion, which is China's running out of people. Uh, they've got this authoritarian government that is ineffective. And before the end of the decade, they're going to have a population collapse, potentially, you know, everything else collapse. Where do you guys see things going in the next 10 years with uh, the geopolitical status of China? I think the... Uh that those two camps are very interesting because mm. both rely a lot on statistics, which is very, very important. But the statistics coming out of China are bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, it's Did, who believes that only 5,000 people died of COVID over uh, how many years? You saw that you've probably seen that graph where it right. shows the infection rate and it like quickly gets to about 5,000 and just flat lines like for two years without a single yeah. other death. You know, seriously, even the Chinese government admits that they um, put out BS uh, GDP numbers. Okay. You cannot, you know, anyway, get back to yeah, that. You just can't rely on the statistics. My point is that statistics yeah. have to come from somewhere. Yeah. And we're getting to a point now where we're seeing things go from taking Chinese statistics verbatim to which is which is causing a lot of people to think that China will become the dominant power in the world. And then you have things where because there's no lack, of, because there's a massive uh, lack of transparency in data points from China, they come up with crazy ideas like uh, we can look at how long the lights are on. Yeah, from uh, space, across, from, from satellites. Space, because yeah. if China's going to be lying about that, we'll look at actual real concrete data. And that's not to say neither of those things have some weight of truth to them. But we're at a point now where it's so polarized because China has controlled its own narrative this entire time. We don't have any reliable data. So Winston and I have always been very careful, not not to just not want to be wrong, but not to make any massive predictions. I can't tell you when China is going to invade Taiwan. I think they will at some point. can't tell you when it's going to happen. But you have every Tom, Dick, and Harry telling you it's going to happen tomorrow or it's going to happen 10 years from now. There's no way of knowing what China is going to do. You can have an educated guess about what the leadership might do. I'm watching China completely close itself off to the rest of the world while offering kind of this fake olive branch to different developing countries where we'll help you develop in exchange for a lot of sovereignty, really. Mm -hmm. um, we're watching stuff like that happen. But in terms of like global leadership and watching the U.S. like fall apart and China taking over and stuff, it's really impossible to say. I can say this, though. I don't want to see a world that is led by a China that I watched kind of come out around 2015 to 2017, 2018 era. I don't want to see a world led by that power. I don't want to see a world led by a government that will throw its own people under the bus, will sacrifice human life and dignity and everything just to remain in power, that will do anything to stop any negative narrative about anything that it does to completely suppress speech, freedom, and human rights across the board. If you think China is doing bad things right now, like it is in like we have Xinjiang, or even really across the entire country to its own people, you better believe that they're going to do that elsewhere. And I think it's best that we stop bickering about who did what, when, where, why, how, and this country is better for whatever situation, and to really hone in on the fact that it might be broken, but democracy in its current state, as broken as it is, is the best option that we have to combat a country like that. Because I'm telling you right now, 10 years in China, as much as I love China and I love Chinese people and I, it's, it, I consider it my second home, under the current leadership, it is not the future that anybody wants for the world. Yeah, I'm going to have a differing opinion, actually. I'm going to go out there and say that um, China is failing. And uh, China's failing from a certain aspects. Number one, the economy is going down massively. It's it's You're, led so it's going by, down. You you say not just flatlining and growth. You think it's no decreasing. no it's going it's going down. I mean just just while I was still there, um, I I left in 2019. 
the spending power of people has gone down because the debt that was incurred during this massive boom going up, buying all these houses and so on, it's now starting to come to roost. I'm starting to see, and I started to see for the very first time, this idea of just being able to buy and just, you know, get another property and just go get another loan and work the system. I saw that start to slow down and pretty much stop and now get to a point where people are actually worrying about like their investments and worrying about things. The government is very good at deflecting away from the fact that the economy kind of was on this tr massive trajectory going up, just nonstop. There was nothing in, in sight that could have stopped it to a point where it actually just came to almost a screeching halt. And so they just, you know, you had the Evergrande collapse, which has been very hush-hush, and people don't even talk about it anymore. That's how effective they are. You had all of these massive things happen, and the economy just kind of plateaued, like you said, flatlined. And it's going down, all right? The only reason why China still gets money and still keeps going is because, first of all, they hide all the problems, and second of all, they keep tricking the rest of the world into, into investing into them. So you get all these BlackRock and all these other big things. Invest in China. It's great. China's still on the rise. China's still this massive good thing. People keep throwing money at China and keeping the zombie afloat. It's actually going down. They're incredibly incompetent. Their dealings around the world in Africa and everywhere else with the Belt and Road are Sri falling Lanka. apart. Yeah. Okay? They're not doing very well because the big projects like the hydroelectric dams that they built are cracking and forming issues. And, and so the local governments and so on aren't happy with what China is doing. And now they owe China massive amounts of debt for broken infrastructure, infrastructure or half-assed stuff. They're not doing well. They just look like they're doing well. And they keep tricking the world into fearing them and to investing in them and to and working with them. And the stupid thing is they do all of this while treating the rest of the world like an enemy, putting on these military parades, threatening to invade Taiwan blustering. Oh, you've crossed the line. You're going to do this. You don't, you will be facing consequences if you do this. It's very blustery. They treat the rest of the world like an enemy, but at the same time say, you invest, invest in us. Come on, you know, give us your money. You know, let us buy up your land. Let us do all this stuff. Let us put our spies all over the place. Let's keep stealing your intellectual property, but you know, invest in us. So I'm going to say, I'm going to side on more of the Zahan side of things here. <laughs> to pick a side. And I'd say that it's an incompetent mess that is being propped up by very good propaganda, very good optics, very good spin doctors to keep it all going. And the fact that nobody can actually penetrate this opaque system, which is so heavily censored. You send a journalist into China to try and uncover a story from outside, you'll see how quickly they get picked up and they're, they're followed. And everything that they're supposed to see is what they're going to see. Because the government knows they're going there and they'll arrange it. They'll rebuild an entire village overnight if they have to, just to fit a narrative. What's going on in China is rubbish. This whole thing about lifting people out of poverty, all they did was lower the benchmark for what being poor is. Mm -hmm. If you go up to the countryside like we have, people are still very poor, incredibly poor out there. You know, my heart goes out to them. I love the Chinese people and I love China. I just hate this government that will sacrifice and push its own people down to fit a narrative. So I'm going to say it's not going to last. <clears throat> there may be some terrible conflict that arises from the fact that mm -hmm. they're collapsing and they need to do something because they don't want to fail and lose, lose control. But if it's going to continue down the trajectory it is right now, China is not going to be this next big superpower that suddenly takes over the world and has the best economy and all that. That's never going to happen. I want to clarify and say I absolutely agree with that. But my, I guess my point I'm trying to make is that you never know what global leadership is going to do in response to that stuff. Mm. So it's uh, if China was to lay bare all its current issues and its actual global power projection, it would fail overnight. Mm. I truly believe it's a dysfunctional country that has it's horrific leadership and massive problems surmounting. But I have not seen the world really come together and yeah. and, and question that. That's, and that's my true. that's yeah. my problem. You're absolutely right. The rest of the world keeps buying the BS that they spin, yeah. and uh, and so do the local people in China because the Chinese government, when there's a problem, they just sweep it under the carpet. You know, whenever there's a big thing. That happens in China, like, for instance, that woman, woman that was chained to the wall. Okay, this happens. I don't know if you are familiar with that story, but um, in, a, in a rural village in China, 
some people were going. There was like a, an influencer, live streamer, who used to stream about his kids. So some people went to go and donate to his kids. And they found that his wife was chained by her neck to the wall in an outhouse. And uh, she'd been a sex slave that he'd purchased from somebody and given him all these kids over the years. Of course, this is actually fairly common in rural uh, China. That's, I just wanted to say, Winston and I were flabbergasted that people thought this was a new thing. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, it fi- it's one of the rare cases where there's enough uproar that it got national attention and it couldn't be censored. They tried. They shut the entire village off. They didn't allow anyone to come in and out. The village is still shut down to this day. But it was a flash in the pan. Big stories like that. Big controversies that go on in China get swept under the rug so successfully. Talk about Peng Shui. What happened to that whole story? What about the COVID outbreak? Yeah. That uh, it wiped out their entire medical system. Yeah, no, the COVID, but now the world kind of thinks that, oh, maybe it didn't come from China. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know what I mean? It's just stupid that's stuff what I'm like saying. that. Yeah. Uh, that's why I'm not completely yeah. uh, pessimistic about China's influence in the world, is they've managed to control the narrative time and time again. Got yeah, it. and uh, just to get back to the woman who was chained to the wall, she disappeared not only from the, the public eye in China, but the world. Wow. Nobody talks about it. Nobody cares about it. And that's what China is very good at doing, is making massive mistakes or doing very bad things out in public and sweeping it under the rug successfully to the point where the rest of the world's like, oh, Uyghur genocide? Oh, sh- Tibet? Nah, whatever. Here, take my investment money. You know? not, not to mention just in China, but people start <laughs> yeah. making too much noise about the, you know, the bad dealings of the Chinese government in other countries, including the U.S. They set up freaking police stations <laughs> and hunt down dissidents on U.S. soil. So mm-hmm. let's just say they've had a pretty successful track record yeah. in controlling the narrative. Yeah. Got it. So I'm trying to make sense of, I mean, you, you mentioned, you know, this woman chained by the neck, but you were surprised that people thought that that was new. And, yeah. you know, you describe an incredible video, but also your story of working for someone who you found out was a serial rapist and that there was an entire system and structure around him that uh, supported, allowed for, uh, made, made ending that incredibly difficult. I'm trying to, does this make sense as I try to figure this out? China like went from, I don't want to call it the stone age, but like an agrarian society to a totally industrialized thing in this in the span of what a generation or two, yeah. And what took the you know the United States two or three hundred years, and then also had these cultural shifts and women's suffrage and a difference in you know how do we feel about races that are different than our own? Uh, all of these cultural things that supported that industrialization that allowed us to have a more I don't know uh, progressive society didn't have the time to develop. You still have, like, if that's happening in mass in these little villages, there's, it makes sense to me that that is viewed as, I guess, tacitly okay. Is that, yeah. am I understanding, am I making sense of that? Does that track yeah. at all with your understanding? Yeah, I don't think you're, um, I don't think your comparison to America is wrong. I do think there's a couple things lost in translation there, mm-hmm. and that's to assume that China had any sort of massive cultural shift like the U.S. did. The U.S. has people electing officials and it has grassroots political organizations and has things all the way down to the PTA, you know, Parent Teacher Association. Yeah. China has none of these things, right? Mm-hmm. So China's framework that was written by Mao Zedong hasn't actually really changed. The deep core leadership of the Chinese government has always kept the fact that the Chinese government is first and foremost the most important part of China. Whether that was actually what happened in society is a different thing, but that could that tap could always be turned on, right? And it's currently being used right now in current day society. But a lot of the societal issues that you see happen, and I think this goes back to your point before about talking about what's hyper focused on in the media, mm-hmm. is publicly addressed in the U.S., talked about, hyper-focused on, and potentially dealt with in the end, not not just through legislation, but also through, you know, just people's mindsets changes, cultural shifts. Mm. That stuff doesn't happen in China because when something bad happens in China societally, China not only shuts off the rest of the world from seeing it, but also shuts off its own people from seeing it to the point where the vast majority of people of in China don't know about really anything negative that happens in their own country. Therefore, society is is at a standstill to the point where it can't really become an uh, an empathic place 
because nobody knows that there's something going on around them. And when someone points it out, they go to jail. It's a very poisonous system. That yeah. is, you know, sorry, ahead. I just wanted to point on, um, there, there is merit to what you say about the sudden increase in technology yeah. and the sudden increase wealth. in wealth and the sudden increase in infrastructure and so on. It's very overwhelming for certain members and certain parts of Chinese society to deal with. We see this with, um, you know, people not understanding how escalators work or elevators sure. work or the basic basic things. The fact that, and this might sound weird to you, but car sickness is a massive issue in China. Every time yeah. we went on road trips, people will be puking all over the place. They didn't grow up in a car. Yeah, because they just never had that experience of being in the backseat of the car when they were growing mm. up. So now you've got adults who hop on little minibuses or something in the countryside and they have to stop every couple of minutes while people get out and vomit. It's, mm -hmm. it's something Very you see seat. with your own eyes and you're like, what is going on? Why is everybody puking everywhere in the yeah. rural countryside of China? Yeah. And you figure it out. It's because none of them ever got that experience of yeah. driving in a car. It's the same with the traffic there because nobody grew up driving in a car. Mm -hmm. They didn't have their parents to show them how to drive properly. So it's chaos. Wow. You know, there's things like this that you have to take into account that definitely fit into your whole idea of yeah. the switch. Yeah. And Matt, one thing you said, it, you, the way you describe China, like it's almost if it were a singular person, it, this is what happens when you suppress and repress acknowledging your own issues is you, you can put off dealing with them. You can fit in with a group for a little bit longer, but ultimately nothing ever gets solved. As you described, it's it, the empathy doesn't develop because you're not internally looking. And, uh, that seems to be a difference between the authoritarian face saving regime of China and, you know, the imperfect democratic, but willing to self reflect to a greater degree West that, that is, uh, just interesting to think about. Yeah, actually, believe it or not, I used to watch a lot of your content when I was in China. <laughs> a buddy of mine used to sit down, uh, we used to sit down together and we were trying to get used to how to be on camera. Yeah. We used to watch your videos to like coach us through it and be like, how do I, how do I not look like an insecure douchebag? Love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so glad. I'm honored. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, so there's a, a handful of other little stories that I wanted to touch on. By the way, was it helpful? Did you, uh, do you feel like the, the videos of it? Oh yeah. 100%. Incredible. Yeah. I'm, I'm putting that uh, testimonial on our website. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we, we touched on a lot of this. Um, I, I haven't heard an update. I don't know if you guys have any idea on Jack Ma. So there was that whole thing where, you know, he said, hey, maybe it would be good if we were a little bit more open. And then he disappeared for a month. I And then he came back and his mind was changed, which I thought was incredible personal development. But I'm curious mm -hmm. if you guys have any idea what, like, what type of experience does a multi-billionaire have does he go to a camp is he locked at home is he do any any speculation or understanding of what might have happened there he was recently spotted living in japan mm -hmm. so you know he kind of just appeared out. in in japan but then he i believe he went back to china again yeah mm -hmm. um you know i guess the government tells you shut up get out of the spotlight they probably put them under house arrest you know, they did that with that famous actress, uh, Fan Bingbing, when she, you know, mm -hmm. it was a common, like a tax thing. They disappeared her. Nobody knew where she was. Nobody, not her agent, no one. Didn't know where she was for months. And then she resurfaced. Oh, I have to pay my taxes type thing. They just disappear people. So uh, they do probably put them under house arrest, maybe a detention center, I, whatever. I, I don't like to be vague about this, though, because I would never know. I'm, I, don't, mm -hmm. I can't be in the shoes of a billionaire. Sure. Yeah. Um, but what I can say is concrete examples of anonymous people. I kind of keep anonymous, but people I know that open their mouth a little too big. Not not as a, like a massive thing, like take down the Chinese government type of level, but it's caused too much of a stink in a local area. And what happens to them is they are, house arrest kind of looks like this. You have your minders that are always keeping tabs electronically on you. So they're watching what you're doing online, on your phone, who you're calling, who you're texting and stuff. So that's kind of a fence in its own self. I don't think people realize how unbelievably robust China's security apparatus mm -hmm. is. But this person also would have daily visits, and we call that uh, going for tea. Um, that's either when a police officer or somebody in the government comes to your house, or you go to the police station and they talk to you about not only what you did wrong, 
but what effects that might have on your family members and people around you. And you wouldn't want anything to happen to your mother. I know your mother's sick. Mm. Yeah. You wouldn't want anything <clears throat> to happen to your kids. You know, they, they really need to finish school, don't they? You know, to provide wow. for the family in the future. They use intimidation tactics like this. Now, if you scaled that up to Jack Ma, I couldn't tell you. I mean, he probably had a whole entourage of stuff going on. Yeah. yeah. And he can move to Japan, but it's like, you're still not free. Like, you know, people in China, you, you know, that oh. do whatever you want you out in the sing? world. Yeah, no, you can't say anything. Just like yeah. we're never free. Yeah, that's <laughs> yes. well. I'm so glad you not not so glad you said that. I'm sorry that that's the case. But you guys, uh, what safety precautions have you had to take, and what have you dealt with since you were able to get okay physically out of mainland China? But I know that you guys have made videos about how mm -hmm. some of the uh, attempts on uh, your reputation and other things have have not stopped. Well, there's there's a, a kind of a policy we've both created, uh, and that's not we don't talk too much about specifics. And there's a reason you don't want to inspire anything. Fair enough. One. And number two, yeah. you don't you'd also don't want to cause anything to sh change tactics because if you're yeah. on top of something, mm. you understand how it works, right? Um, but really, just base level intimidation started. Uh, remember, you were talking about your story about your uh, trying to find your wife mm. and you uh, via yeah. her yeah. in China. Um, there was a bit of disassociation with some of the security apparatus in China slash some of the people that are going after us because even after I had left, they were trying to find my wife at her work and sending huge paper reports, trying to find her stamp by the government, all this kind of stuff, therefore trying to get, get to me too. Mm -hmm. uh, but when they figured out that we were in America, they obviously sent... I'm not, I just don't want to get into too many specifics, but they sure. sent a lot of people after us. Let's just say, wow. yeah, they've been. We've us. we've had like like actual yeah. real life interactions, yeah. physical um, conversations, and they've been obviously people threatening, trying to dox where we are, trying to swat us, try to do all the usual stuff. Now the the thing is, it, it really kind of ruins the way you do things. We used to be very mm -hmm. open. We used to go have sub subscriber meetups yeah. all the time. You know, we used to do that kind of thing. It was a big part of what we did. It was a lot of fun. We can't do that anymore. Right. You know, we can't actually publicly announce where we're going to be. So we have to be very careful just about the way we move around. And, you know, if we film things, we can't let anyone know our location or mm -hmm. the time of day or anything. So people can try to figure out where we are at any given time. So, you know, there's all sorts of nonsense that goes along with that. You know, I enrolled my, my kid in school and under a different name, that kind of thing. Wow. You know, it's, it's a lot of things you have to do. It's It's an unfortunate... It sucks. It really does. But it's just precautions you have to take because at the end of the day, the Chinese government and all the people that work for them, they have no morals or scruples. They just want to silence you and they'll do whatever they can. And it's usually through intimidation, you know, but you just don't want to take a chance. Yeah, I will. Uh, uh, I want to end that part with a positive thing. And I, mm -hmm. we've seen a big shift. Like since we, yeah. we came to America, it was a very lax attitude on this kind of stuff. We have now seen things like law enforcement and stuff take this very, very seriously. And I would say to potential Chinese threats that are, are working for the Chinese government, that going after a U.S. person is a very bad idea right now. Uh, much worse than much worse idea than it was a few years ago. <laughs> yeah, the, they've been ramping up with the whole transnational repression yeah. stuff. You know, they're catching. They've just arrested those two guys in New York which yeah. is fantastic, who are involved in that police station. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the, these guys do go uh, after dissidents and after people that oppose the Chinese government. They go after them on foreign soil all the time. Um, and so now, especially in America, they're being taken serious and, and there are repercussions, which is fantastic. Yeah, I think we'll see a big shift in that. Yeah. I'd say, I can't speak for other countries, but I'd say if you are trying to speak about the human rights abuses of the Chinese government, the U.S. is probably where you want to be. Mm. Yeah. Um, how, I mean, it's I, obviously you guys have uh, made taken the precautions that you need to, and you're keeping yourself safe. Uh, how do you feel with all of that stuff? Does that is that a daily worry? Is it just normal life at this point? I mean, the things that you're describing, if it were just to happen to someone from one day to the next, that's that's a huge shift in, okay, in right, life. Yeah. And I'm curious how you're how, what the emotional experience of that is. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any reason to pretend like I'm a big, strong dude that doesn't give a shit about any mm -hmm. of this, right? I don't think that serves any good. I do think it's important to never show people that something like this could supersede your morals, like a, a threat like this, right? Mm -hmm. Because that means that that entity supersedes any potential uh, person from trying to stand up against it, right? 
So it's not a David and Goliath scenario. I like to think of it like this. I understand the risks. I understand how it works now. I understand the burden that I've taken on, but I don't want that to make other people feel like it's not a burden worth taking on. And that's what I tell a huge chunk of our audience is actually Chinese dissidents. It's Chinese people that can't speak out against the Chinese government, whether they're in China, whether they're in America, whether they're in Europe. They reach out to us and say, thank you so much for what you're doing. And that is the fuel and the power that makes you continue to realize, hey, what I experienced those 10 years isn't a lie. What I see the Chinese government doing to hurt people all over the world isn't a lie. It's worth talking about, and it's worth the risk, and it's worth doing. Because if you're not going to stand up against tyranny, then what the hell are you doing? If you know what I know, if you know what he knows, if you're silent about that, then who did you help in your life? When you have thousands of people reaching out saying, thank you for doing what you're doing, you're actually making a change. Yeah, for me, quite honestly, the, the whole threat of this whole thing, I mean, the whole reason they do what they do, try to find you, try to intimidate you, is to silence you. And I'm never going to allow that to be effective. You know, that's this this idea, this the disgusting behavior that they, they participate in. I'm not going to allow that to work. So it's not going to silence me. And it also... In a way, I appreciate some of it because it gives me a lot of uh, material and a lot of <laughs> motivation, okay? I, I don't know if you saw, I made a video and it's titled, it's a question, by the way, not a statement. It's like, are Chinese men cowards with a question mark? It's a question, all right? It's like, is this cup full? Doesn't mean it is, right? Um, I made that video and that was when they did this whole thing against my wife. And I just put it out there. And I showed the forums where they were discussing how to give me a mental breakdown by, you know, doing all these things to me and, and so on. And by actually exposing it, these forums got so much pushback from really good, proper, like upstanding Chinese citizens who went to these forums and said, what the hell are you guys doing? Mm -hmm. Shut them down, gave them pushback because... That's a big problem on the Chinese internet is when you talk about attacking foreigners or any kind of bad behavior, um, it's never challenged. You know, normally if you were to, I don't know, create a forum about how to attack and ruin people's lives, you know, on a normal like Facebook or something, they'd shut you down. But not in China, un uh, unless you're talking about local Chinese people, of mm -hmm. course. But foreigners, they don't care. But that was very effective to shut that down. Um, and actually it did stop a lot of that kind of behavior because people, they lost face and they realized – if they do continue to attack me and my wife in such a way, I'm just going to expose it and make them look bad and make China look petty and, and silly. So it kind of stopped that. But again, like I said, it gives me a lot of motivation and it gives me a lot of material stuff that I integrate into my videos maybe a little bit more subtly these days. Mm. But it gives me a very good inside track into the tactics of the Chinese government and the intimidation tactics that they use to go after, like you said, pro-democracy dissidents or Tibetans or, you know, yeah. Uyghurs or whoever overseas. So it does actually give us a lot of good In many stuff. ways, it's, um, it's helped us interface with the Chinese dissident or pro-democracy kind of scene because yeah. we can warn people and tell people what they're doing because it's happened to us. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and I'll just point viewers towards a video of yours that I enjoyed, the Chinese honey trap. Uh, where they, yeah. where they, uh, you know, one of, I think a lot of people have been honey trapped, but for different non-political purposes, uh, yeah. they, when they reach out to you on, uh, what is it? WhatsApp or something. It's like, Hey, are you John from music class? Yeah. With a pretty yeah. girl. What, uh, I'll ask on this. This is, we can sort of wind down. I think you guys, uh, in terms of, uh, powerful answers, your last one is this, this is a little bit more lighthearted. What? What do they hope happens? You know, I get a message from someone that says, are you John from my music class? What, what is, how does that go? I mean, that's just a pig butchering scam. I got a whole video on that. It's very straightforward. Mm -hmm. They're trying to get you to buy cryptocurrency, uh, fake cryptocurrency. They're basically trying to scam you for money. It's a, it's a money scam. And if I'm foolish enough to engage with this person, I may, I may be foolish enough to eventually send them money. Is that the belief? Oh, it's, it's, be surprised. Like some people will reach out and be like, "I saw your pig butchering scheme video. I totally understand." By the way, I don't think this one is. <laughs> yeah, <perfect. laughs> Dude, she's they're very, really pretty, and she really likes. Yeah, they're very good at what they do. You know, they take they they. I, I did another one, you know, I got a thing called a scammer named Salad who tried to... I, <laughs> Salad, yeah. And I just kept leading her on to see where it goes. But they're very sophisticated now. They'll even mm -hmm. like get um, friends of theirs or people that they pay living in America or whichever country 
to take like little quick videos around them. Hey, look, I'm driving in this place. And then they send it. So you think you're talking to a real person that lives in your country, in your neighborhood or whatever. And then they, they've got a whole database. So if you're interested in cars, they'll talk to their guy who knows about cars to get all the information and wow. pictures to send to you to kind of string you along and develop a friendship. And it's called the pig butchering scam because it's about raising a pig before you slaughter it, right? So they will spend months, maybe even up to a year, developing this relationship. So, you know, it starts with a like, hey, I got the wrong number or hey, you know, did you pick up your dog from the groomers yeah. yet? Or, you know, some crap like that. And you get involved. And it gets to this point where you really feel you know the person that you either develop a very strong friendship or a romance or mm -hmm. whatever it is. And then they start to get you into, hey, my uncle's got this great way of earning money through cryptocurrency or something. And, you know, then you lose all your money. Now, the wow. dark side of that, I didn't want to have to bring this up, but it's very important that we say is that a lot of the people you're talking to are potentially slaves. Yes. Wow. These uh, Chinese gangsters actually run these massive operations usually out of Myanmar, mm -hmm. uh, Burma and Cambodia and they get they entrap these people they uh, give them a job opportunity or whatever to move abroad these people move abroad to Myanmar or Cambodia then all of a sudden they're inside of these illegal gambling operations yeah, passports get taken away they get their passports taken away they're you know there's armed guards that prevent them from escaping so you're potentially talking to an actual like kidnapped human trafficked slave Oh my goodness! Yeah, a yeah. lot of a lot of good material about that. People have, uh, I believe, Danny Gold under Underworld podcast and stuff. They did some actual like show up and try to figure this stuff out. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a bunch of documentaries about it. Wow, uh, that's. I mean, this is a silly question. I don't know if you know the answer. How does that occur? Slash, how do you guys have any idea how this stops? You know, because when you think of slavery in the United mm -hmm. States, it's we, we put an end to that uh, almost 200 years ago. Uh, and then you hear, which, or I have heard, that it exists in these other parts of the world, mm -hmm. but it sounds inconceivable. Mm -hmm. uh, it's corruption. You cannot put an end to it. It's not possible. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's, it's only possible. As long as the money is rolling yeah. in. But it's only possible if the, the political leaders in these countries are receptive to other countries being allowed to investigate and try to put an end to it because mm -hmm. their whole political chain is paid all the way to the top. Yeah, it's corruption. So what are you going to do when, when the, you know, the highest leadership of this town is literally complicit in this illegal casino where they're selling tiger meat and freaking underage kids as sex slaves to Chinese tourists, right? What do you, what do you do at that point? I mean, you have to kind of allow foreign interference in your country and that's never a popular thing. So it's this horrible, horrible enterprise. And unfortunately, it oh, I mean, literally, if you look into it, you can pretty much follow the money to China almost every time. Wow. Yeah, and that's how you stop it, by the way, is you stop funding it. Yeah. If it cannot make money anymore, it doesn't exist. Yeah. There's no industry for it. So through education, and I'm hoping that, the, you know, I made several videos about the pig butchering scam yeah. and the scam, scam There's no industry, salad. right? Yeah, if people are wise enough not to fall for these scams anymore because they make millions and millions and millions, millions of dollars. Billions. Yeah, specifically out of Americans. Uh, and they're very good at this. They target elderly people. They target yeah. vulnerable people. Um, but if people are educated enough not to fall for these scams and the money stops flowing into these scam houses where they hold all these people captive, then there'll be no reason to have those people captive anyway. So, mm. Unfortunately, it sounds like with the advent of AI and voice cloning technology that yeah. these things, I mean, you could get oh, yeah. you could get me. I'm internet savvy. But if I get a phone call from someone I know saying that, <laughs> that they're yeah. in trouble. That's uh, where the stage is, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, well, guys, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, I've learned about de-dollarization. <laughs> well, not all the way. <laughs> well, yeah, you'll you'll dig it into you it. got a video coming soon. It's <laughs> yeah. going to be good. It's definitely going to be worth a watch. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What I learned, and and I'll just, uh, this is, I constantly learn this, is that the things that I think that I know about the world, because I saw six different people mention it on social media, I do not actually know. And I am repeatedly brought back to, what have I done deep personal investigation into usually with my own two eyes by going there and seeing it, or at least by spending a significant amount of time trying to understand a topic. And uh, yeah. I appreciate you guys pointing that one out to me just before I make any 
crazy investments. <laughs> no, else? we're very much in line with you in that in that train of thought for sure. Yeah, thanks thanks for having us on. Really, it's been a great interview. Of course, and where you know people, uh, where should they go to find you? You mentioned that you've got this uh, a very exciting video coming out on de-dollarization. Where's that one going to be? <laughs> and what are the you guys have several channels that you guys are on? Uh, the most important channel to find. Pretty Everything. much the most important work we do is called The China Show. So that's really easy to find. That's our, our live show every single Friday. It's just called The China Show. And we cover all the current events that are happening in China and help people to understand from you know perspectives of people that speak Chinese and look through the Chinese media to understand the current topics in China and understand from a perspective of, you know, we don't work for any sort of media organization. Yeah, we're so, independent completely. And we have we a whole actually thing, mean that. Yeah, yeah we, have, <laughs> we have a whole thing called Soft Power Hour, which is all about how the Chinese government is trying to trick you into thinking something. Yeah. Uh, so it's always a, a good segment on the show. So definitely, so definitely yeah. just just go to the China show and you can find it. Yeah, you'll find there. everything else from there. We'll have links to our, all our other channels. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Well, thank you guys. And uh, thank hopefully you. we'll have you back on sometime when we find we out to. if China's going up or down. <laughs> we'll yeah. see. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, guys.